Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is your host, Morteza Hajizadeh from Critical Theory Channel. Today, I'm honored to be speaking with Professor Bernard Harcourt from Columbia University about a wonderful book that he published with uh, Columbia University Press called Cooperation, a Political, Economic, and Social Theory. Bernard, welcome to New Books Network. Thanks so much for having me, Morteza. It's great to be here. Um, it's 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 an honor to be able to speak with you again about uh, your book. And I think I previously spoke with you about a couple of years ago about uh, the, your previous book, which was called um, Critique and Praxis. I still have it there in my library. And now right. this one, Cooperation. And when I was reading this book, I could see a lot of connections, which which is something that I guess we can talk about today as well. Uh, can you just very briefly tell us how the idea of this book came to you? In a nutshell, what is this book about? Sure, sure, sure. Well, you know, um, yeah, you were you you mentioned critique and praxis, which was the book before, and uh, you know, I had finished that. It actually came out right when the pandemic um, exploded, and um, and so I was dealing with both the, the 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 problems and the crises of the pandemic, but also dealing with the crises of, of global warming, thinking about them, and trying really really trying to think how from a critical perspective, we could you know, make some headway, kind of find some ways to think about these crises that might, you know, offer alternatives to what feels like a pretty disastrous moment and a uh, moment of despair. And what it became clear to me was that they're, they're surrounding us everywhere around us are actually forms of practice that rely on cooperation that provide a real alternative to the extractive capitalist forms of exchange that are grinding this earth really to a halt, right? And so I, I kind of looked around and, I, and, I, and rather than coming up with something new that, has been un, that hasn't been done yet before, that is sort of impossible or such a far stretch, such a reach, I saw so many examples of kind of projects, uh, worker cooperatives or, or, or food cooperatives, consumer cooperatives that are, that are everywhere around us and that actually offer a different model uh, than capitalist competition. They offer this model of cooperation. And it became clear to me that if we could kind of build on already existing forms of cooperation, that actually we could start to address much better uh, the the global uh, climate crisis uh, and other things too, as well, such as uh, such as pandemics and 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 other crises. Mm. So yeah, so that's that's how it came about. It came about in kind of like a in a dark moment, um, which. To a certain extent, we're we're still in. Well, there are two points that you want to discuss with you. One of them is this cooperative model, which is actually the title of your book as well. But before that, you discussed, you mentioned some of the crises that we are in, we were stuck in, and it's especially in the times of pandemic. I guess it was easy to see how some minorities are being scapegoat stereotypes for some of the crises that are in the West. But in general, do you think there is this? liberal democracy in the West is in crisis and what caused this crisis? Yeah, right. So, so that, that's another aspect that's really important here, which is, so for instance, in the United States, you have the House of Representatives, which is Republican. You've got a Senate that, uh, that no one can beat the filibuster, which is the, the, the way in which the Senate gets blocked in the United States. You need 60 votes to, 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 get past a filibuster. You've got the, the you got the president right now, that's Biden's Democrat. You've got the Supreme Court that is extremely conservative and striking anything down that would come from the Democrats. And so you've basically got a gridlock. It's it's impossible to to it's impossible to pass green legislation, for instance. It's impossible to pass legislation that would address global climate change. And in fact, the legislation that was passed in 20 um 20 well, 
under Biden in 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 2021, uh, which was uh, which was the Inflation Reduction Act, which was a green bill, was only passed as a as a as a budget reconciliation measure. It wasn't actually legislation. It was mm. it was through a budgeting mechanism that bypassed uh, the Senate filibuster. So we're we're at we're at we're at a roadblock in terms of uh, electoral politics in this country. There's and there's no way to imagine, uh, it, regardless of what happens in the 2024 elections, presidential elections, and 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 House and Senate elections, there's really no way to imagine that uh, Congress is going to be able to address these problems uh, and the problems of global climate change. So we have to find other solutions, and that's where cooperation becomes imperative. Our cooperation becomes actually the only solution that's available to us now. Uh, let's come up with a definition. Um, more or less, I guess there are, as you mentioned, in, you you focus in the, on the United States. I think in my home country, which is Iran, of I remember uh, similar models. But I was a kid, so I don't really know how the, the nuts and bolts of it. But what is cooperative economy or cooperism? in your book as a theory and there's all we always hear that yeah capitalism is not the best system but there's no other alternative but there seems to be there are a lot of small scale alternatives that are already happening can you talk about that right sure there are there are many <laughs> experiments and ongoing kind of functional uh, alternatives to a capitalist system of shareholder equity corporations right so and and some of them are very large right so it's not it's not only at a very small local level but basically we're what we're talking about are um economic organizations of commerce say exchange bank banking insurance uh, any kind of manufacturing which instead of relying on a a uh, shareholder investor who is the equity holder of the corporation and who takes the benefit and, and, and for whom the corporation is managed to increase the benefits. You replace that shareholder investor essentially by the members of the cooperative. Okay. And you, eliminate the kind of extractive function of the shareholding process so that the members become the owners now and so it's it's actually a very simple and it's i mean it's existed for well now for centuries as an alternative to the typical uh public or or private shareholder model um, and and it, and it works through membership fees, basically. So, for instance, in a consumer cooperative, uh, the members of the cooperative uh, buy a buy 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 a small piece or contribute a contribute a small amount. Like a co-op, like um, REI, which is pretty well known, which sells clothes and sporting goods and whatnot. You become a member, you you pay twenty dollars, so you become a member of the cooperative. And then when thousands and hundreds of thousands of people join, right, that becomes the equity base of the entity. Now, it's run by the members then. And what happens is that uh, the members uh, become stakeholders uh, of the corporation and aren't gearing the corporation towards their 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 personal profit they're not trying to extract the profit out of the corporation uh, but they're trying to have a multi-stakeholder uh, cooperative process uh, that can work to the benefit of all of the stakeholders right now um it's important to realize that sometimes there can be conflicts it's not it's not easy um, but there are certain principles that have been developed in the context of cooperatives that have existed now for centuries i mean the, the there are seven principles of cooperatives 
uh, about the fact that they have to be member owned, that they have to be um, uh, uh, run democratically, that each member has one voice and one vote. Uh, right, it's one member, one vote. Uh, so rather than having one large institutional equity holder who decides everything, everybody has a vote. It has to be autonomous. It has to work with other cooperatives. It has to, and it has to be sustainable. So there, there, there are these principles that have been worked out that are associated with cooperatives that really make this entity uh, one that instead of trying to kind of extract profit and give it to the shareholders, right, is trying to develop a sustainable, environmentally sound, uh, a long-term business that would benefit all mm -hmm. of the stakeholders of the enterprise, mm -hmm. right? And so it's really a different way of thinking about economic exchange. It's a different model of a political economy. Um, and it, um, it offers uh, a, a model that can be used in any field, whether it's banking. So uh, credit unions are examples of cooperatives in the banking area. The depositors are the owners mm -hmm. of the credit union. It works in the context of mutual insurance companies. And in fact, in the mutual insurance in the in the insurance industry, mutuals are predominate in many countries. Uh, most many of the large insurance uh, consortiums began as mutuals, right? People coming together uh, on their own and becoming members of a of a mutual to insure themselves. Mm. Uh, it operates in the context mm. of worker cooperatives, and and there. What's important to keep in mind is that we often think of those at a very small level. Uh, however, worker cooperatives can grow to very to 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 large to become large consortiums. Think here, of course, of the very well known and dis often discussed in this context Mondragon Corporation in Spain, which is uh, an industrial equipment corporate corporation, which is the seventh largest industrial group in Spain. It's got, it's a consortium of cooperatives. Mm -hmm. uh, All together, they have approximately 74,000 workers. So it's, mm -hmm. it's huge, right? Um, and uh, billions in, um, in revenues and in, in sales. So uh, it's not necessarily the case that this is a, a small scale model. It can be uh, general. It can it can operate at at a large scale in the United States. Uh, there, REI is a large mm. consumer cooperative. Uh, Land of Lakes is a very large producer cooperative. These names are household names uh, for Americans, mm. um, and it's true as well abroad. Uh, in France, the banking industry is tending to become predominantly mutualized. Um, there are very few large private banks left in France today, BNP, Paribas, Société Générale, but that, that's almost it. Most, most of banking is tending towards um, things like the Crédit Agricole, which in part was deep. It has an interesting structure, but it was it's it's formed by thirty nine uh, credit unions uh, and mm -hmm. other uh, credit unions essentially. Uh, but this is true in other areas as well with retail cooperatives, uh, producer cooperatives, agricultural cooperatives. Of course, are very are very widespread around the world. Um, mm -hmm. But so the idea is to is to kind of build on the cooperative model um, and to the the three kind of core principles of cooperism as I develop them in the book are the idea of kind of concentrate first kind of concentrating uh, forms of cooperation so that they work together and build on each other. So this is, for instance, a, a worker cooperative 
that uses a credit union or a mutual uh, in order to help the functioning of the worker cooperative. Mondragon, again, is a classic example. They developed their own credit union uh, that lends money to the workers to become part of the cooperative, the worker cooperative itself, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. th the first principle really is concentrating and compounding the cooperation into the most powerful and effective mechanism. So, so building out cooperation in a way so that it becomes more of an economic regime uh, rather than just one small uh, food co-op. Um, the second principle that I try to develop in the, in the book is this idea that it has to be understood as a, a, a deliberate and chosen uh, economic form. And here, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, there isn't a natural evolution towards uh, cooperism or cooperation. It's not going to happen by itself. Uh, it needs to be chosen deliberately by people, which is true of any economic form. Uh, this is a much larger debate about whether there are such things as economic laws that favor one form of political economy over another. I do not believe that there are economic laws in nature mm -hmm. that favor either capitalist competition or cooperation. Um, I think it needs to be chosen and, and understood as deliberately chosen. Uh, and then the, the third principle that I is very important in this context is that the cooperatives and the cooperism be open and inclusive. Now, that's one of the principles of uh, cooperatives that have been formulated. One of those seven principles is that cooperatives need to be open and inclusive, meaning that they can't exclude people, so there can't be discrimination, um, and they have to be open to uh, people who want to participate in the cooperative enterprise. And that's another core principle of cooperism. But what it gives us ultimately is an, e an alternative economic regime uh, to what we have today, uh, which is not extractive, not trying to extract the profit to the benefit of the, the small wealthy class that owns the uh, equity share but rather that's trying to distribute in an equitable way, in a fair way, resources to all of the stakeholders who are participating mm. in the cooperative enterprise or in the cooperist economy, mm. basically. Uh, this is a fascinating model. And as you have mentioned, there are, and in the book, you outline a number of already existing um sustainable and and working examples of these cooperation or cooperative economies but i'm sure there are always ex skeptics um and i'm going to play the devil's advocate here sure of uh, course maybe two questions i have one of them is first of all how does what is the um the mechanism that runs this cooperation in terms of is there a central authority there uh in terms of the administration to make sure that it's a democratic system that may be one question the second question is that and when sometimes my friends and i talk and say well I've, I've kind of abandoned hope in the labor government in australia and maybe we should go for the greens they 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 have all the right things to say they want to do the right thing but they don't have enough power but then we know if we get the if they get the power then there are these big corporates who might start uh you know derailing what they have said to do so the second question perhaps is that Given the power of corporates, how do you do you think how can we make this idea of uh, corporate cooperism more viable, more widespread? How can we make sure that um, they won't, you know, you know what I mean? They won't hijack the cause. Right. Yeah. 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 No, you've got you've got those are those are great, challenging questions and important things to to address. Um, there are a few things in there, so let me unpack it a little bit. Um, so first, like the fear of um, 
some kind of concentration of power within how, how do you, how do you avoid the concentration of power within uh cooperism i think was mm. was the first challenge you were raising now at the micro level at the level of the cooperative the individual cooperative right um the concentration of power is avoided by the rule essentially that's part of the bylaws of a cooperative that is part of the effectively the the constitution of the cooperative that every cooperative member have one vote right so the actual structure the voting structure of the cooperative uh it uh, avoids the possibility of concentration of power mm -hmm. that's that and that's one of the most important things about cooperatives or one of its most uh important uh valuable things about the cooperative that's certainly not true in the traditional corporate context where the votes depend on how many shares you hold, which means that there can be concentration of power in the majority shareholder, which means that if you own 51% of a corporation, of the equity of a corporation, you can dictate what happens and the other shareholders have no real voice. In the cooperative, the way they are structured uh, under the principles of uh, cooperatives is to require one member, one vote rules. And that is really important. And it is what avoids potential concentrations of power. Now, that's at the micro level. At the macro level, and with when, if you think about cooperism as an economic regime, um, yeah, you, you, what you your 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 challenge was how do you avoid kind of power becoming held in the hands of uh of of particular actors at the at the economic regime level and here i think that it's important to acknowledge that it is unlikely in any economic regime that we are going to be able to eliminate final decision making mm -hmm. and final decision making power in other words in other words there are always going to be conflicts there's always going to be tension there's always going to be challenges and people arguing about different interests and arguing about different understandings of the common interest and so the question and so i'm not so naive as to think that uh law and litigation and conflict is going to disappear in a uh in a space of cooperism you know i mean you know the in the 19 in the 1920s soviet legal theorists like pashukanis and others did believe that law would eventually disappear in the communist state um i mean the withering of the state also entailed the withering of law for a lot of soviet legal theorists uh tragically many of whom were purged uh in 37 and 38 by by stalin um i i i don't i i i'm not i would i think that is naive so so I agree that there will always be a need for final decision makers, what we think of as judges who adjudicate competing claims to an economic system in, within an economic system. But what I suggest in the book is that what what would avoid concentrations of power, I think, would be if those bodies that were charged with ultimately making decisions um in contested claims to resources or whatnot if the bodies were themselves constituted 
by people who had a long history of cooperism mm. of having of having been faithful to the cooperative values and principles and i think that i think that that would at least i mean there, there's no way ultimate there's no silver bullet there's no structural institutional mechanism that will avoid uh mm. problems i think where we always it's always this is where you know it has to be deliberate and chosen and there's always there's always a need for human effort to maintain structures and to maintain a regime an economic regime but if the decision makers uh, in the body that would be adjudicating uh, conflicts within a cooperative economy were persons who who had um, displayed throughout their lives real commitment to the cooperative principles and values themselves, I think that that would help avoid the problem of the concentration of power. Uh, so, okay, so that was one, mm. one question you had was kind of concentration of power. Another challenge that you were raising was whether or not it would be possible to do this within a capitalist regime. In other words, I mean, is it is it possible to try to grow cooperatives if we are within an extractive capitalist regime where the enterprises are themselves going to try and cannibalize these mm. efforts, right? Um, and then I think your, your third challenge was something about... Uh, what, well, what we I call think it was mainly the leaders. idea of corporates kind of hijacking or stamping. Hijacking. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the second one I heard. Yeah. Well, so here, um, uh, you know, I, here's what I would say. I, you, if you if you look at the case of Mondragon, you do have a very large cooperative that is able to function within an otherwise predominantly capitalist system uh, against capitalist uh, groups, industrial groups, that is able to actually achieve uh, success at, a, at an extraordinary level, become the seventh largest group in Spain, and is able to maintain its principles and to produce high quality goods. Uh, I think that we see that in a number of well-functioning cooperatives. Uh, Swan Morton, for instance, in the UK, uh, that makes um, surg surgical blades, that's the leading mm. maker of surgical blades. I mean, uh, uh, other, uh, other ones in the United States, owner, worker, owner worker owner enterprises so not all of them are worker cooperatives in, in the united states some are structured differently but become worker owner organizations uh, like king arthur uh, flower that achieve success in this way king arthur flower is one of the most uh, well-known uh, producers of um, baking flour uh, in in the United States. Now, so uh, the fact is uh, that they are able to compete. In many cases, they have longer long longevity than uh, capitalist uh, enterprises. Uh, so some of the statistics, and I, I mean, I I list them, I, I talk about them in detail in the book. But some of the statistics show, for instance, that um, credit unions in the banking industry have longer expected life than private banks. Um, and in part, that has to do with the fact that the uh, cooperative members uh, really have a stake in the existence of the venture, in the long-term sustainability of the venture, and can also deal with crises in a much more favorable way. And so in times of economic crisis, it turns out that many cooperatives are more successful at 
going on because they can tighten the belt, uh, mm. because they can decide themselves as the owners of the enterprise to tighten their own belts in particular ways that allow the enterprise to survive the economic crisis. Whereas in the in a more conventional extractive capitalist system, it's certain layoffs, it, it's it's wide scale layoffs, etc., and there isn't a sharing of the burden of the crisis. So, I, the the you know I think that the proof in a way is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. um, we can see these organizations um, operating, uh, not getting cannibalized uh, necessarily, and so and so I think that the I think that what we need to do is kind of focus on how well they're doing and use them as a model uh, for, uh, for, for, for constructing more uh, cooperism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But there was another thing in your, in your question, which had to do with the alternative model of, you know, a social democratic state-based model right and i think i think from a critical theory perspective it's important to to talk about that um because because a, a lot of people are resistant to the idea of cooperism mm -hmm. or at least in, in my in my conversations uh, resistant because they prefer or they think that it is more likely that we could kind of address some of these crises, deal with some of these crises through uh, the welfare state, mm. through a social democratic state-based model. And I would say, and, 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 and I would say that there, there may well be some countries where that is possible. Um, I think that the analysis of cooperism has to be very kind of, GPS specific, right? And that was always something that I was focusing on in, in critique and praxis, that the solutions and the, the ideas that we come up with have to be very specific to the, the political context and the mm. political situation. And it's possible, it's possible in some countries, and often it's when I'm with German interlocutors that there's an there's a greater emphasis on the on on what we call the welfare state or the provident state. But that, that, but that is not where we are headed in the United States. And so, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of thinking about this in the American context, uh, the uh, the 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 welfare state has been and is being gutted in this country mm -hmm. uh, th through a process of neoliberal privatization which makes it completely unlikely that that is how we're going to be able to address these issues. And in part, in part on, on global climate change, um, the, 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 the United States is, is really uh, struggling uh, mm -hmm. because of the, because of, because of the effects of neoliberalism and, um, and the inability of the state to be really, uh, of, the, of the U.S. government to really be intervening productively in that area. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we are much more likely uh, to achieve uh, positive change in the global climate context through um, uh, an enlargement of cooperism, mm -hmm. uh, at least in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what I really liked about the book is that you you again bring your lawyer side into the book as well. You talk about uh, and and to me first it was a surprise, but then I could see the connections, and I'm sure our listeners would be interested to know about the social impacts of such a model. Do you think this model can help to can help address some of the issues with crime and punishment? In the book, you talk about uh, abolition uh, democracy, and I'm interested to know what it means and how it can help address uh 
address how it can help us have a better holistic understanding of human nature and issues of crime and punishment as well. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's very important. The, I mean, in the book, I try to develop a three dimensional theory of cooperism, uh, not only as a full blown economic regime and not only as a a political theory, um, but also as a social or having a, a social theory dimension. Um, and that's where uh, these questions of crime and punishment become uh, important. Um, part of the part of the way that society is structured right now is based very much on a on an individual competitive model that depends on punishment as the means to uh, glue society. And what I mean by that is, is it's very simple. We have a punishment paradigm in this in this country, in the United States. I see it, I see reflections of it elsewhere. Um, but I see it full blown in the United States. A punishment paradigm in which basically, and here in part is the problem of the evisceration of the welfare state, but uh, we we do not uh, publicly support people. Uh, we do not provide the the welfare net you know, the welfare webbing uh, to support people. We're very hesitant to invest in public education. Uh, we have we don't have very good public health systems. Uh, we don't have drug treatment programs at a, at a at a public level that are uh, respectable and uh, and and effective. Everything is privatized. So if you if you want drug treatment, you you've got to you've got to be willing to shell out tens of thousands of dollars uh, to to help someone get placement in a private drug clinic in this country it's extraordinarily expensive what we so we don't we don't really you know spend our money on on public education or drug treatment or mental health etc um, we allow people to kind of develop on their own go in their own directions. But then when we think that, or when we suspect that they have uh, violated the criminal law, then we impose this punishment paradigm and we're pretty much willing to spend endless amounts of time and money to punish people, right? And that's what I mean by the punishment paradigm. Just to give you a sense of this, because it's, it's just so flagrant. We are prepared in New York City, where I live, where I work most of the time. We are prepared in New York City to pay more than half a million dollars to incarcerate one person for one year at Rikers Island, which is the, the jail for New York City. Okay. And those are numbers are from the controller of the city of New York. Uh, it's 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 approximately five hundred and twenty thousand dollars to put one person in jail for one year. Okay, wow. more than half a million dollars. Now, just think about that for a second, right? We're not we're not willing to fund, you know, healthy public education, uh, good public health services, treatment programs for people when they're having difficulty. But the minute they end up in jail, we're willing to spend half a million on them per year. I just think of all just think of how distorted that is. All of all of the things that one could have done with half a million dollars for a person, or maybe a fifth of that, maybe for five people, right? Over the course of a year, in terms of giving them, I don't know, therapy if they needed it, drug treatment if they needed it housing if they needed it 
food, is that they're not living on the street, homeless, begging. I mean, we've got an extraordinary problem. Tens of thousands of people who are homeless in New York. Um, and so, and so it's this, when you think about it, it's the exact same kind of extractive logics uh, that are so fundamental to capitalist competition in a way. You know, it's like, we leave you on your own. If you flourish, that's great. If you don't, bam, we're going to, we're just going to, we're going to punish yeah. you. And, 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 and I think that the model of cooperation, I think that many of us have been trying to figure out how could, what, how could we replace the punishment paradigm? What could we replace it with? I know we've, we've talked a lot about the, an education paradigm. Well, the paradigm really that would replace it would be a cooperation paradigm. And what would that mean? So this is the social theory dimension of the, of, of cooperism. What it would mean is that um, we would invest in kinds of co we would we would have a network of forms of cooperation that would provide support for people who need it um, before uh, they get into trouble or or when they have addiction problems, right? So we would invest in and 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 we would be part of members of a whole network of cooperative projects that would provide the support network for for our neighbors um mutual aid projects uh, many many of these would be mutual aid projects and mutual aid is a form of cooperation mutual aid fits perfectly within the paradigm of cooperism um but what it would allow at the social fabric level would be institutions of cooperation that people could um, be part of, fall back on, and, um, and, and participate in as a way to displace uh, the punishment paradigm. Now, ultimately, uh, you were asking about um, abolition democracy. And, and the idea of abolition democracy, uh, the, the 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 term abolition democracy was really coined by W. E. B. Du Bois mm -hmm. in his book uh, Black Reconstruction in America, and which was published in 1935. And the idea, well, in in the book, actually, the the term is somewhat ambiguous. Um, the way that W.E.B. Du Bois uses it. But the way it's been interpreted, let's say, the, the dominant way in which it's been interpreted uh, is as follows. The idea basically was that abolition um, wasn't enough. Uh, abolishing slavery wasn't enough because it wasn't tied to the construction of all kinds of positive institutions and practices that would have helped the persons who were formerly enslaved become full members uh, of society. That there wasn't the educational system, there wasn't the uh, job training, there wasn't the skills training, there wasn't the financial uh, training, et cetera, that would have allowed formerly enslaved persons uh, to, to really integrate society. Now, of course, there was also massive repression. So it's understood that it's not just a problem of lack of creating the institutions. There was also massive repression, violent um, uh, response to Reconstruction, uh, the formation of the Ku Klux Klan, mm. um, and other white citizens groups violent racism lynching etc but there was also just a void of democratic institutions and so the way abolition and democracy is understood or interpreted it was that basically w.e.b du bois his idea was that emancipation wasn't enough in itself it needed to be accompanied by the creation of institutions and practices uh, 
for uh, formerly enslaved persons. Now, uh, Angela Davis picks up on this idea of abolition democracy in, in the 1970s and, and 80s and, and 90s uh, to develop a similar idea in the carceral, in the, in the prison context, in the prison industrial complex context. And her idea and the idea of others and critical resistance and elsewhere is that um, it's not enough to, to, to abolish prisons. We also need to put in place the mechanisms, uh, the, 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 the jobs, the education, the health care systems, et cetera, that would allow everyone to thrive. I said, you can't just have a negative abolition. You also have to have the positive construction. That's, that's the idea of abolition democracy, which goes with trying to transform political economy entirely. Um, now, uh, I, in, in the book, I, 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 I base a lot of the social theory on abolition democracy. Um, but in the same way in which you know, abolition democracy itself was trying to remedy the problem of, uh, of of focusing only on abolition and not on the constructive side. I think I, I, I speak about it more in terms of cooperation democracy. Uh, it, it could be cooperism democracy, but that's a little bit hard off the tongue. But so the idea is cooperation democracy as a way to think about this social theory of cooperism uh, cooperation democracy in in the in in the way in which we would think about creating institutions and practices to replace the punitive paradigm right and so and so that's really what i have in mind with the idea of cooperation democracy um, but it all goes to the to this notion that when we think about cooperism, it really has to be multi multi-dimensional. It has to, we have to aim towards a full economic regime of cooperation that is fully justified at a political theoretic level. Um, and that also is a social theory along the social dimension that it would structure and transform our social interactions. And basically the way it would transform our social interactions would, to, would be to displace punishment as the key mechanism or glue that we use uh, in society and replace it by uh, forms of, of cooperation, mutual aid uh, and support. Yeah. Um, I have two more questions. Sure. Uh, one of them is that more recently, there has been a lot of literature on the idea because capitalism is obsessed with profit, growth, and increase. And there has been a lot of literature on the idea of degrowth. So the question I have is this idea of uh, cooperism do, to, to be able to even better operation, op uh, operationalize it. Do we need to rethink the concept of growth? Because I'm sure that a lot of people might think who are not familiar with these models might think that this is only an equal distribution of poverty, maybe. Those kind of very superficial criticisms that they lay against any welfare program or any other alternative. So, But do you think that this idea of cooperism, because it also aims to address some of the global uh, problems such as climate change, do we need to rethink the concept of growth as well? Or does yeah. it have it within right. its framework? Right, right, yeah. Well, first of all, I, I, I would say we definitely need to rethink the concept of growth. Um, and there's a flourishing movement, a degrowth movement uh, that has been flourishing since, well, you know, Andre Gortz was, was one of the persons who instigated this uh, thinking about degrowth in the 1970s. Um, but that is that is essential. Uh, many of the markers that we use in terms of GDP, et cetera, are faulty uh, because they don't really they don't really evaluate human welfare uh, as much as they do 
consumption. And so most of the growth models that are based on GDP are skewed and are not a good reflection of whether society is flourishing or not. So I think that cooperism definitely relies on challenging the traditional ways in which we think about growth. Um, I am not, in the book, I suggest that cooperism does not necessarily need to take the position that degrowth is the best way forward. Mm -hmm. It may well be, uh, but I'm not entirely sure that cooperism necessitates taking a position on degrowth. Uh, the, 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 the issue of degrowth is complicated because it's not because we can't think of it at a, as a, at a universal level. I think there are some places on human earth where we could not have degrowth, where, where we need, um, we need economic, uh, improvements at the level of increased welfare of the people. There are certain places where I think we might be able to have degrowth. Uh, but I don't think and but but I don't think that we can talk about degrowth universally as like if you see what I mean. Um uh, and um and so therefore and so therefore i think we need to be careful about kind of degrowth policies um uh, and how they would be uh, administered uh, there there is there is a there is a form of redistribution that could be achieved through cooperatism that would help to that would help to alleviate some of the unconscionable poverty in some mm. parts of the world, mm. uh, and that could kind of kind of could be used to bring things in a better equilibrium uh, in mm. terms of equity uh, mm -hmm. around the world. Um, but that that's a that's a those are. Uh, those are complicated questions. I think that they're questions that we have to address. But one thing, I maybe 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 the important you know, meta point here is that cooperism, as I see it, is not necessarily an an end state, and does not necessarily address all of the matters that we do need to address, such as questions of degrowth and questions of global equity. I think it's a stage, and it should be thought of as a stage, in economic development or, or, or in economic history. It should be mm. a, thought of as a stage, as, as the next stage in economic history, and not a final resting point. Um, it's not, I'm not sure where a cooperatist economic regime would tend to once it has been established mm. itself, right? Um, you know, I could imagine it going in various different directions, but I think it's an absolutely necessary next stage to address global climate change and also to begin to address some of these questions of, 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 of degrowth and, um, and global equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I really like that idea of because some people might think of it as an ultimate utopia, but I really like the idea of of it being a stage in a continuum um, of a political yeah. uh, a political economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's important because you know there can be other stages afterwards, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's just a question of how do we how do we make it through? How do we make how do we get through the global warming crisis to begin with and remain a sustainable society? Mm. Right. And the final question, have you already addressed some of the criticisms maybe 
or challenges of cooperism, but you have a whole chapter, um, uh, chapter seven, which is a defense of cooperism. And uh, I, I'm curious to know what is maybe the main, uh, main, main criticism against it that you have addressed in the book, or maybe the, uh, the maybe it would be good if we could talk about the historical criticism from the left, because it seems to be a very, it seems to be very favorable to the left, but. It, but not necessarily, and there might be criticism right. from those on the left as well. Right. Oh no, 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 no. Yes, there, there is, there is definitely criticism on the left because there are many left projects that depend on a very strong state, mm. right? Um, so, I mean, socialism. And the way in which communism played out, but socialism, for sure, I mean, and it's difficult to distinguish between the terms and the concepts and the way that they've existed in reality. But you, you're, you understand what I'm saying. Socialism and communism have typically depended on a very strong state. Uh, and this model of cooperatism does not depend on a very small state. It does not depend on the evisceration of the state. It's not as if there's no state. It's realistic to the fact that there are going to need to be mechanism, coordinated mechanisms, final decision makers on, on litigation and other things. So it's not an elimination of the state, but the state is not the main actor here. It's not the main engine of of political or social uh, coordination. The main engine is these forms of cooperatives. So the main engine is the individuals who are members of cooperatives and have an equal voice, right? And so there are, there are many left critiques of this project uh, that mm. would say it's fanciful or it's not, it's not, it's not going to be out capitalism because what we need is a strong kind of coherent mm. block of a state or something that would be able to, or, or a, 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 a radical revolutionary uprising that would completely um, replace the mm. state with some other form of uh, static organization um so uh there's a certain element of it's not it's not anarchist but there is a certain element of relying on the members of cooperatives to be the force here and that mm -hmm. obviously is in conflict with many leftist visions uh, mm -hmm. and there are you know many persons who might be a member of, say, a socialist party, which has the idea that, no, the state should become the, the, the dominant power that na nationalizes industries, for instance. These are, mm. this, isn't a, this is not a notion of nationalized industry, mm. right? Um, it's not mm. These are not state-run. On the contrary, uh, they are cooperatives. They're run by the members. They're member-owned. That's very different than a model of a state-run, uh, state-nationalized uh, industries. Um, and um, and and although there are parallels between public utilities and sometimes cooperatives, it's those are those are very different models. So you're entirely right that there's going to be a lot of friction on the left as mm. well as uh, with uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, now, my the, the argument I make in the book is that actually a lot of the traditional ways in which uh, both socialist and communist theories have been developed um, have tended to go in the direction of uh, state um centric uh forms of organization that ultimately do not end up being that different than capitalist mm. 
uh, state centric organization uh, and and so and so this is a bit of a this is an unorthodox uh, my 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 argument is both an unorthodox reading of capitalism and an unorthodox reading of communism as mm -hmm. communism mm -hmm. has played out um mm -hmm. unorthodox with regard to capitalism because i basically i argue that that actually capitalism the it's the it, capitalism is an illusion it's the illusion of free markets that was another book that i that i wrote yeah, but this yeah. idea of the illusion of free markets is that it's not there is, there is no free market it's 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 all regulated everything everything is regulated and predominantly regulated by the federal government so in other words the fact that the government will the federal government will be here in the united states to bail out the big banks as we did in 2011 bail out Citibank, Bank of America, AIG, et cetera. And the the fact that the federal government is there to secure the fact that we will pay the national debt and we will pay our treasury bills, all of that is absolutely essential to capitalism being maintained. So capitalism mm -hmm. is actually state dirigism, I would argue, uh, for the wealthy. Mm. That's my unorthodox reading. My unorthodox reading of the way that communism has played out is that it is state dirigism for the party members, basically. And I and I think if you look at China right now, it's kind of an interesting blending of a form of capitalism and a form of communism that is uh, state dirigism. Mm. Cooperism is is the opposite of both of those. Cooperism is bottom up or bottom down. It's it's about members of cooperatives. It's about cooperative members being in control of the economy, right? And so, in that sense, um, in that sense, yes, it's gonna it's gonna it's it's gonna be severely criticized mm -hmm. uh, by many people on the left and and on the right. But I. I do believe, I sincerely do believe that it offers a different paradigm than both capitalism and communism, which mm. themselves, I think, are misnomers. Mm -hmm. um, I realize yeah. it's, it's an unorthodox interpretation, but, uh, but I think it's right. Mm. Yeah, it was quite interesting what you said about um, free market. As a matter of fact, Three days ago, I recorded another podcast, uh, Free Market, A History of an Idea. And uh, yeah, and I was reminded of your book as well. I think you have Illusion of Free Market, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's the name of your book you wrote in 2018. Don't yeah. remember the date exactly. Yeah, and the and the author was a supporter of free market himself. But he said, look, I, it's impossible to have a free market without government intervention, without government making And those uh, purists, yeah, or... Uh, let's say market fundamentalists like Hayek or Friedman. Friedman was was his, his salary in Chicago University was paid by state government money by taxpayers. Um, yeah, and it's kind of impossible to for, for free market to exist without a government mechanism. Yeah, I mean that was the whole that was the whole point of my book, the illusion of free markets from 2011, where I tried to document the way in which. And if the 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 best example of the free market, which is the commodities exchange pit, right? The place where people are like, yeah, you know, they're buying pork bellies or 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 grain or whatever. And it looks like this free market where it's just sellers and buyers going crazy, you know, like raising their hands, buying this, buying that, buying this. It's like, it's like, yeah, right. That's the free market. The free market sets the price. Well, it turns out that to have that pit. You have to have so much government regulation to create that pit, mm -hmm. right? Including, including rules about fixing the price when the books don't um, even out at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. right? So even price fixing, um, but but everything about you know preventing, but everything about you know preventing corners and. And and misrepresentation, all of the all of the 
work that it took to create something like the Chicago Board of Trade. Mm. That's what my book was about. It's a show that it's like, no, this is a, an entirely government constructed space and fiction. Mm. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and that's why, you know, but it's government constructed, right? And and socialism is also nationalized government. Here, the model that I've got, the model that, I, that I'm advocating for in cooperation, the model of cooperism is really, it's it's us it's it's the workers the consumers mm. the depositors right trying to create a sustainable economy based on cooperation mm -hmm. yeah and i can absolutely see how it's a viable one and i think uh i'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, the late david graber and one of his interviews he said we need visionary politics and i think to be able to convince more people we do need to be able to think beyond these reductive options or alternatives we've been given um and and having that visionary vision let's say that political vision would would, would enable such a viable model that as you mentioned it's not really utopian thinking it's already working and it, and in your book you have come up with a lot of examples both small and also very very large scale projects that are perfectly functioning um and and it could provide a guideline for for some of the crises that we're facing today That's professor so. professor bernard harker thank you very much it's been a pleasure to talk to you again and hopefully if you have a new book out i'll be able to talk to you soon about it in a year or so maybe definitely definitely thank you more i appreciate you. it greatly. thanks